Chapter 3 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Marden Boys with No Chance In the blackest soils grow the fairest flowers, and the loftiest and strongest trees spring heavenward among the rocks. J. G. Holland Poverty is very terrible, and sometimes kills the very soul within us. But it is the north wind that lashes men into Vikings. It is the soft, luscious south wind which lulls them to lotus dreams. Oyuda Poverty is the sixth sense. German proverb It is not every calamity that is a curse, and early adversity is often a blessing. Surmounted difficulties not only teach, but hearten us in our future struggles. Sharp. There can be no doubt that the captains of industry today, using that term in its broadest sense, are men who began life as poor boys. Seth Lowe. Tis a common proof that lowliness is young ambition's ladder. Shakespeare. I am a child of the court, said a pretty little girl, at a children's party in Denmark. My father is groom of the chambers, which is a very high office, and those whose names end with Sen, she added, can never be anything at all. We must put our arms akimbo and make the elbows quite pointed, so as to keep these Sen people at a great distance. But my papa can buy a hundred dollars worth of bonbons and give them away to children angrily exclaimed the daughter of the rich merchant Peterson. "'Can your papa do that?' "'Yes,' chimed in the daughter of an editor. "'My papa can put your papa and everybody's papa into the newspaper. "'All sorts of people are afraid of him, my papa says, "'for he can do as he likes with the paper.' "'Oh, if I could be one of them,' thought a little boy, "'peeping through the crack of the door, "'by permission of the cook for whom he had been turning the spit, but no, his parents had not even a penny to spare, and his name ended in Sen. Years afterwards, when the children of the party had become men and women, some of them went to see a splendid house, filled with all kinds of beautiful and valuable objects. There they met the owner, once the very boy who thought it so great a privilege to peep at them through a crack in the door as they played. He had become the great sculptor Thorwaldsen. This sketch is adapted from a story by a poor Danish cobbler's son, another whose name did not keep him from becoming famous, Hans Christian Andersen. There is no fear of my starving, father, said the deaf boy, Kito, begging to be taken from the poor house and allowed to struggle for an education. We are in the midst of plenty, and I know how to prevent hunger. The Hottentots subsist a long time on nothing but a little gum. They also, when hungry, tie a ligature around their bodies. Can I not do so too? The hedges furnish blackberries and nuts, and the fields turnips. A hayrick will make an excellent bed. The poor deaf boy with a drunken father who was thought capable of nothing better than making shoes as a pauper, became one of the greatest biblical scholars in the world. His first book was written in the workhouse. Creon was a Greek slave, as a writer tells the story in Kate Fields, Washington, but he was also a slave of the genius of art. Beauty was his god, and he worshipped it with rapt adoration. It was after the repulse of the great Persian invader, and a law was in force that under penalty of death no one should espouse art except free men. When the law was enacted, he was engaged upon a group for which he hoped some day to receive the commendation of Phidias, the greatest sculptor living, and even the praise of Pericles. What was to be done? Into the marble block before him, Creon, had put his head, his heart, his soul, his life. On his knees, from day to day, 
He had prayed for fresh inspiration, new skill. He believed, gratefully and proudly, that Apollo, answering his prayers, had directed his hand and had breathed into the figures the life that seemed to animate them. But now, now all the gods seemed to have deserted him. Cleone, his devoted sister, felt the blow as deeply as her brother. O oh, Aphrodite, she prayed, immortal Aphrodite, high and throne child of Zeus, my queen, my goddess, my patron at whose shrine I have daily laid my offerings, to be now my friend, the friend of my brother. Then to her brother she said, O oh, Creon, go to the cellar beneath our house. It is dark, but I will furnish light and food. Continue your work. The gods will befriend us. To the cellar Creon went, and guarded and attended by his sister, day and night, he proceeded with his glorious but dangerous task. About this time all Greece was invited to Athens to behold an exhibit of works of art. The display took place in the Agora. Pericles presided. At his side was Aspasia, Phidias, Socrates, Sophocles, and other renowned men stood near him. The works of the great masters were there, but one group far more beautiful than the rest, a group that Apollo himself must have chiselled, challenged universal attention, exciting at the same time no little envy among rival artists. Who is the sculptor of this group? None could tell. Heralds repeated the question, but there was no answer. A mystery, then. Can it be the work of a slave? Amid great commotion, a beautiful maiden with disarranged dress, disheveled hair, a determined expression in her eyes, and with closed lips, was dragged into the agora. This woman, cried the officers, this woman knows the sculptor. We are sure of it, but she will not tell his name. Cleone was questioned, but was silent. She was informed of the penalty of her conduct but her lips remained closed. Then, said Pericles, the law is imperative, and I am the minister of the law. Take the maid to the dungeon. As he spoke, a youth with flowing hair, emaciated, but with black eyes that beamed with the flashing light of genius, rushed forward, and flinging himself before him, exclaimed, O oh, Pericles, forgive and save the maid. She is my sister. I am the culprit. The group is the work of my hands. The hands of a slave. The indignant crowd interrupted him and cried, To the dungeon, to the dungeon with the slave. As I live, no, said Pericles, rising. Behold that group. Apollo decides by it that there is something higher in Greece than an unjust law. The highest purpose of law should be the development of the beautiful. If Athens lives in the memory and affections of men, it is her duty to art that will immortalize her. Not to the dungeon, but to my side bring the youth. And there, in the presence of the assembled multitude, Aspasia placed the crown of olives, which she held in her hands, on the brow of Creon. And at the same time, amid universal plaudits, she tenderly kissed Creon's affectionate and devoted sister. The Athenians erected a statue to Aesop, who was born a slave, that men might know that the way to honour is open to all. In Greece, wealth and immortality were the sure reward of the man who could distinguish himself in art, literature, or war. No other country ever did so much to encourage and inspire struggling merit. I was born in poverty, said Vice President Henry Wilson. Want sat by my cradle. I know what it is to ask a mother for bread when she has none to give. I left my home at ten years of age and served an apprenticeship of eleven years, receiving a month's schooling each year and at the end of eleven years of hard work, 
a yoke of oxen and six sheep, which brought me eighty-four dollars. I never spent the sum of one dollar for pleasure, counting every penny from the time I was born till I was twenty-one years of age. I know what it is to travel weary miles and ask my fellow men to give me leave to toil. In the first month after I was twenty-one years of age, I went into the woods, drove a team, and cut mill logs. I rose in the morning before daylight and worked hard till after dark, and received the magnificent sum of six dollars for the month's work. Each of these dollars looked as large to me as the moon looks tonight. Mr. Wilson determined never to lose an opportunity for self-culture or self-advancement. Few men knew so well the value of spare moments. He seized them as though they were gold, and would not let one pass until he had wrung from it every possibility. He managed to read a thousand good books before he was twenty-one. What a lesson for boys on a farm! When he left the farm, he started on foot for Natick, Mass, over one hundred miles distance, to learn the cobbler's trade. He went through Boston that he might see Bunker Hill Monument and other historical landmarks. The whole trip cost him but one dollar and six cents. In a year, he was the head of a debating club at Natick, before eight years had passed. He made his great speech against slavery in the Massachusetts legislature. Twelve years later, he stood shoulder to shoulder with the polished Sumner in Congress. With him, every occasion was a great occasion. He ground every circumstance of his life into material for success. Don't go about the town any longer in that outlandish rig. Let me give you an order on the store. Dress up a little, Horace. Horace Greeley looked down on his clothes, as if he had never before noticed how seedy they were, and replied, You see, Mr. Sterrett, my father is on a new place, and I want to help him all I can. He had spent but six dollars for personal expenses in seven months, and was to receive one hundred and thirty-five from Judge J. M. Sterrett, of the Airy Gazette, for substitute work. He retained but fifteen dollars and gave the rest to his father, with whom he had moved from Vermont to western Pennsylvania, and for whom he had camped out many a night to guard the sheep from wolves. He was nearly twenty-one, and, although tall and gawky, with tow-coloured hair, a pale face, and whining voice, he resolved to seek his fortune in New York City. Slinging his bundle of clothes on a stick over his shoulder, he walked sixty miles through the woods to Buffalo, rode on a canal boat to Albany, descended the Hudson in a barge, and reached New York just as the sun was rising. August 18, 1831. He found a board over a saloon at two dollars and a half a week. His journey of six hundred miles had cost him but five dollars. Four days Horace wandered up and down the streets, going into scores of buildings and asking if they wanted a hand, but no was the invariable reply. His quaint appearance led many to think he was an escaped apprentice. One Sunday at his boarding place he heard that printers were wanted at West's printing office. He was at the door at five o'clock Monday morning, and asked the foreman for a job at seven. The latter had no idea that a country greenhorn could set type for a polyglot testament on which help was needed, but said, Fix up a case for him, and we'll see if he can do anything. When the proprietor came in, he objected to the newcomer, and told the foreman to let him go when his first day's work was done. That night, Horace showed a proof of the largest and most correct day's work that had then been done. In ten years he was a partner in a small printing office. He founded the New Yorker, the best weekly paper in the United States, but it was not profitable. 
When Harrison was nominated for president in 1840, Greeley started the log cabin, which reached the then fabulous circulation of 90,000. But on this paper at a penny per copy, he made no money. His next venture was the New York Tribune, price one cent. To start it, he borrowed a thousand dollars and printed five thousand copies of the first number. It was difficult to give them all away. He began with six hundred subscribers and increased the list to eleven thousand in six weeks. The demand for the Tribune grew faster than new machinery could be obtained to print it. It was a paper whose editor, whatever his mistakes, always tried to be right. James Gordon Bennett had made a failure of his New York Courier in 1825, of the Globe in 1832, and of the Pennsylvanian a little later, and was only known as a clever writer for the press, who had saved a few hundred dollars by hard labor and strict economy for fourteen years. In 1835 he asked Horace Greeley to join him in starting a new daily paper, the New York Herald. Greeley declined, but recommended two young printers, who formed partnership with Bennett, and the Herald was started on May 6th, 1835, with a cash capital to pay expenses for ten days. Bennett hired a small cellar in Wall Street, furnished it with a chair and a desk composed of a plank supported by two barrels, and there, doing all the work except the printing, began the work of making a really great daily newspaper, a thing then unknown in America, as all its predecessors were party organs. Steadily, the young man struggled towards his ideal, giving the news fresh and crisp from an ever-widening area, until his paper was famous for giving the current story of the world as fully and quickly as any competitor and often much more thoroughly and far more promptly. Neither labor nor expense was spared in obtaining prompt and reliable information on every topic of general interest. It was an uphill job, but its completion was finally marked by the opening at the corner of Broadway and Ann Street of the most complete newspaper establishment then known. One of the first things to attract the attention on entering George W. Child's private office in Philadelphia was this motto, which was the keynote of the success of a boy who started with no chance. Nail sign la bolle. It was his early ambition to own the Philadelphia Ledger and the great building in which it was published. But how could a poor boy working for two dollars a week ever hoped to own such a great paper. However, he had great determination and indomitable energy, and as soon as he had saved a few hundred dollars as a clerk in a bookstore, he began business as a publisher. He made great hits in some of the works he published, such as Kane's Arctic Expedition. He had a keen sense of what would please the public, and there seemed no end to his industry. In spite of the fact that the ledger was losing money every day, his friends could not dissuade him from buying it, and in 1864 the dreams of his boyhood found fulfillment. He doubled the subscription price, lowered the advertising rates, to the astonishment of everybody, and the paper entered upon a career of remarkable prosperity the profits sometimes amounting to over $400,000 a year. He always refused to lower the wages of his employees, even when every other establishment in Philadelphia was doing so. At a banquet in Lyons, nearly a century and a half ago, a discussion arose in regard to the meaning of a painting representing some scene in the mythology or history of Greece. Seeing that the discussion was growing warm, the host turned to one of the waiters and asked him to explain the picture. Greatly to the surprise of the company, the servant gave a clear, concise account of the whole subject, so plain and convincing 
that it at once settled the dispute. "'In what school have you studied, monsieur?' asked one of the guests, addressing the waiter with great respect. "'I have studied in many schools, monseigneur,' replied the young servant. "'But the school in which I studied longest and learned most is the school of adversity.' Well had he profited by poverty's lessons, for, although then but a poor waiter, all Europe soon rang with the fame of the writings of the greatest genius of his age and country, Jean Jacques Rousseau. The smooth sand beach of Lake Erie constituted the full scap on which, for want of other material, P. R. Spencer, a barefoot boy with no chance, perfected the essential principles of the Spencerian system of penmanship, the most beautiful exposition of graphic art. For eight years William Cabet had followed the plough. When he ran away to London, copied law papers for eight or nine months, and then enlisted in an infantry regiment. During his first year of soldier life, he subscribed to a circulating library at Chatham, read every book in it, and began to study. I learned grammar when I was a private soldier on the pay of sixpence a day. The edge of my berth, or that of the guard bed, was my seat to study in. My knapsack was my bookcase. A bit of board lying on my lap was my writing table. And the task did not demand anything like a year of my life. I had no money to purchase candles or oil. In winter it was rarely that I could get any evening light but that of the fire, and only my turn even of that. To buy a pen or a sheet of paper I was compelled to forego some portion of my food, though in a state of half-starvation. I had no moment of time that I could call my own, and I had to read and write amidst the talking, laughing, singing, whistling, and bawling of at least half a score of the most thoughtless of men, and that, too, in the hours of their freedom from all control. Think not lightly of the farthing I had to give now and then for pen, ink, or paper. That farthing was, alas, a great sum to me. I was as tall as I am now, and I had great health and great exercise. The whole of the money not expended for us at market was two pence a week for each man. I remember, and well I may, that upon one occasion I had, after all absolutely necessary expenses, made shift to have a half-penny in reserve, which I had destined for the purpose of a red herring in the morning, but so hungry as to be hardly able to endure life. When I pulled off my clothes at night, I found that I had lost my half-penny. I buried my head in the miserable sheet and rug, and cried like a child. But Cobet made even his poverty and hard circumstances serve his all-absorbing passion for knowledge and success. If I, said he, under such circumstances, could encounter and overcome this task, is there, can there be in the whole world, a youth to find any excuse for its non-performance? Humphrey Davy had but a slender chance to acquire great scientific knowledge, yet he had true metal in him, and he made even old pans, kettles, and bottles contribute to his success, as he experimented and studied in the attic of the apothecary store where he worked. Many a farmer's son, says Thurlow Weed, has found the best opportunities for mental improvement in his intervals of leisure while tending sap bush. Such, at any rate, was my own experience. At night you had only to feed the kettles and keep up the fires, the sap having been gathered and the wood cut before dark. During the day we would always lay in a good stock of fat pine, by the light of which, blazing bright before the sugar house, I passed many a delightful night in reading. I remember in this way to have a history of the French Revolution, and to have obtained a better and more enduring knowledge of its events 
and horrors, and of the actors in that great national tragedy, than I have received from all subsequent reading. I remember also how happy I was in being able to borrow the books of a Mr. Keys after a two-mile tramp through the snow, shoeless, my feet swaddled in remnants of rag carpet. "'May I have a holiday tomorrow, father?' asked Theodore Parker, one August afternoon. The poor Lexington's millwright looked in surprise at his youngest son, for it was a busy time, but he saw from the boy's earnest face that he had no ordinary object in view, and granted the request. Theodore rose very early the next morning, walked through the dust ten miles to Harvard College, and presented himself for a candidate for admission. He had been unable to attend school regularly since he was eight years old, but he had managed to go three months each winter, and had reviewed his lessons again and again as he followed the plough or worked at other tasks. All his odd moments had been hoarded, too, for reading useful books, which he borrowed. One book he could not borrow, but he felt that he must have it. So on summer mornings he rose long before the sun and picked bushel after bushel of berries, which he sent to Boston, and so got the money to buy that coveted Latin dictionary. "'Well done, my boy,' said the millwright, when his son came home late at night and told of his successful examination. "'But, Theodore, I cannot afford to keep you there.' "'True, father,' said Theodore. "'I am not going to stay there. I shall study at home at odd times, and thus prepare myself for a final examination, which will give me a diploma. He did this, and, by teaching school as he grew older, got money to study for two years at Harvard, where he was graduated with honor. Years after, when, as the trusted friend and adviser of Seward, Chase, Sumner, Garrison, Horace Mann, and Wendell Phillips. His influence for good was felt in the hearts of all his countrymen. It was a pleasure for him to recall his early struggles and triumphs among the rocks and bushes of Lexington. The proudest moments of my life, said Elihu Burritt, was when I had first gained the full meaning of the first fifteen lines of Homer's Iliad. Elihu Burritt's father died when he was sixteen, and Elihu was apprenticed to a blacksmith in his native village of New Britain, Con. He had to work at the forge for ten or twelve hours a day, but while blowing the bellows, he would solve mentally difficult problems in arithmetic. In a diary kept at Worcester, whither he went some ten years later to enjoy its library privileges, are such entries as these. Monday, June 18. Headache. Forty pages. Cuvier's. Theory of the Earth. Sixty-four pages. French. Eleven hours forging. Tuesday, June 19. Sixty lines Hebrew. Thirty Danish. Ten lines Bohemian. Nine lines Polish. Fifteen names of stars. Ten hours forging. Wednesday, June 20. Twenty-five lines Hebrew, eight lines Syriac, eleven hours forging. He mastered eighteen languages and thirty-two dialects. He became eminent as the learned blacksmith, and for his noble work in the service of humanity. Edward Everett said of the manner in which this boy with no chance acquired great learning, it is enough to make one who has good opportunities for education hang his head in shame. The barefoot Christine Nilsson in remote Sweden had little chance, but she won the admiration of the world for her wondrous power of song, combined with rare womanly grace. Let me say in regard to your adverse worldly circumstances, says Dr. Talmage to young men, that you are on a level now 
with those who are finally to succeed. Mark my words, and think of it thirty years from now. You will find that those who are then the millionaires of this country, who are the orators of the country, who are the poets of the country, who are the strong merchants of the country, who are the great philanthropists of the country, mightiest in the church and state, are now on a level with you, not an inch above you, and in straitened circumstances. No outfit, no capital to start with, Young man, go down to the library and get some books, and read of what wonderful mechanism God gave you in your hand, in your foot, in your eye, in your ear, and then ask some doctor to take you into the dissecting room and illustrate to you what you have read about, and never again commit the blasphemy of saying you have no capital to start with. Equipped? Why, the poorest young man is equipped as only the God of the whole universe could afford to equip him. A newsboy is not a very promising candidate for success or honours in any line of life. A young man can't set out in life with much less chance than when he started his daily for a living. Yet the man who more than any other is responsible for the industrial regeneration of this continent started in life as a newsboy on the Grand Trunk Railway. Thomas Alva Edison was then about fifteen years of age. He had already begun to dabble in chemistry, and had fitted up a small itinerant laboratory. One day, as he was performing some occult experiment, the train rounded a curve, and the bottle of sulfuric acid broke. There followed a series of unearthly odours and unnatural complications. The conductor, who had suffered long and patiently, promptly ejected the youthful devotee, and in the process of the scientist's expulsion, added a resounding box upon the ear. Edison passed through one dramatic situation after another, always mastering it, until he attained at an early age the scientific throne of the world. When recently asked the secret of his success, he said, he had always been a total abstainer and singularly moderate in everything but work. Daniel Manning, who was President Cleveland's first campaign manager and afterwards Secretary of the Treasury, started out as a newsboy with apparently the world against him. So did Thurlow Weed. So did David B. Hill. New York seems to have been prolific in enterprising newsboys. What nonsense for two uneducated and unknown youths who met in a cheap boarding house in Boston to arrange themselves against an institution whose roots were embedded in the very constitution of our country, and which was upheld by scholars, statesmen, churches, wealth and aristocracy, without distinction of creed or politics. What chance had they against the prejudices and sentiment of a nation? But these young men were fired by a lofty purpose, and they were thoroughly in earnest. One of them, Benjamin Lundy, had already started in Ohio a paper called The Genius of Universal Liberty, and had carried the entire edition home on his back from the printing office, twenty miles every month. He had walked four hundred miles on his way to Tennessee, to increase his subscription list. He was no ordinary young man. With William Lloyd Garrison, he started to prosecute his work more earnestly in Baltimore, the sight of the slave pens along the principal streets, of vessel loads of unfortunates torn from home and family and sent to southern ports, the heart-rending scenes at the auction blocks made an impression on Garrison never to be forgotten, and the young man whose mother was too poor to send him to school, although she early taught him to hate oppression, resolved to devote his life to secure the freedom of these poor wretches. In the first issue of his paper, Garrison urged an immediate emancipation and called down upon his head the wrath of the entire community. He was arrested and sent to jail. 
John G. Whittier, a noble friend in the North, was so touched at the news that, being too poor to furnish the money himself, he wrote to Henry Clay, begging him to release Garrison by paying the fine. After forty-nine days of imprisonment, he was set free. Wendell Phillips said of him, he was imprisoned for his opinion. When he was twenty-four, he had confronted a nation in the bloom of his youth. In Boston, with no money, friends, or influence, in a little upstairs room, Garrison started the Liberator, read the declaration of this poor young man with no chance in the very first issue. I will be as harsh as truth as uncompromising as justice. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. What audacity for a young man with the world against him! Honorary Robert Y. Hayne of South Carolina wrote to Otis, mayor of Boston, that someone had sent him a copy of the liberator and asked him to ascertain the name of the publisher otis replied that he had found a poor young man printing this insignificant sheet in an obscure hole his only auxiliary a negro boy his supporters a few persons of all colors and little influence but this poor young man eating sleeping and printing in this obscure hole, had set the world to thinking, and must be suppressed. The Vigilance Association of South Carolina offered a reward of $1,500 for the arrest and prosecution of anyone detected circulating the Liberator. The governors of one or two states set a price on the editor's head. The legislature of Georgia offered a reward of $5,000 for his arrest and conviction. Garrison and his co-adjutors were denounced everywhere. A clergyman named Lovejoy was killed by a mob in Illinois for espousing the cause while defending his printing press, and in the old cradle of the American liberty, the wealth, power, and culture of Massachusetts arrayed itself against the abolitionists so outrageously that a mere spectator, a young lawyer of great promise, asked to be lifted upon the high platform, and replied in such a speech as was never before heard in Faneuil Hall, when I heard the gentleman lay down the principles which placed the murderers of Lovejoy at Alton side by side with Otis and Hancock, with Quincy and Adams, said Wendell Phillips, pointing to their portraits on the walls. I thought those pictured lips would have broken into voice to rebuke the recreant American, the slanderer of the dead, for the sentiments that he has uttered on soil consecrated by the prayers of the Puritans and the blood of patriots. The earth should have yawned and swallowed him up. The whole nation was wrought to fever heat. Between the northern pioneers and southern chivalry, the struggle was long and fierce, even in far California. The drama culminated in the shock of civil war. When the war was ended, and, after thirty-five years of untiring, heroic conflict, Garrison was invited as the nation's guest, by President Lincoln, to see the stars and stripes unfurled once more above Fort Sumter. An emancipated slave delivered the address of welcome and his two daughters, no longer chattels in appreciation, presented Garrison with a beautiful wreath of flowers. About this time, Richard Cobden, another powerful friend of the oppressed, died in London. His father had died leaving nine children almost penniless. The boy earned his living by watching a neighbor's sheep but had no chance to attend school until he was ten years old. He was sent to a boarding school, where he was abused, half-starved, 
and allowed to write home only once in three months. At fifteen he entered his uncle's store in London as a clerk. He learned French by rising early and studying while his companions slept. He was soon sent out in a gig as a commercial traveller. He called upon John Bright to enlist his aid in fighting the terrible corn laws, which were taking bread from the poor and giving it to the rich. He found Mr. Bright in great grief, for his wife was lying dead in the house. There are thousands of homes in England at this moment, said Richard Cobden, where wives, mothers, and children are dying of hunger. Now, when the first paroxysm of grief is past, I would advise you to come with me, and we will never rest until the corn laws are repealed. Cobden could no longer see the poor man's bread stopped at the custom house and taxed for the benefit of the landlord and farmer and he threw his whole soul into this great reform. This is not a party question, said he, for men of all parties are united upon it. It is a pantry question, a question between the working millions and the aristocracy. They formed the Anti-Corn Law League, which, aided by the Irish famine, for it was hunger that at last ate through those stone walls of protection secured the repeal of the law in 1846. Mr. Bright said, There is not in Great Britain a poor man's home that has not a bigger, better, and cheaper loaf through Richard Cobden's labours. John Bright himself was the son of a poor working man, and in those days the doors of the higher schools were closed to such as he. But the great Quaker heart of this resolute youth was touched with pity for the millions of England's and Ireland's poor, starving under the Corn Laws. During the frightful famine, which cut off two millions of Ireland's population in a year, John Bright was more powerful than all the nobility of England. The whole aristocracy trembled before his invincible logic, his mighty eloquence, and his commanding character. Except possibly Cobden, no other man did so much to give the labourer a shorter day, a cheaper loaf, an added shilling. Over a stable in London lived a poor boy named Michael Faraday, who carried newspapers about the streets to loan to customers for a penny apiece. He was apprenticed for seven years to a bookbinder and bookseller. When binding the Encyclopaedia Britannica, his eyes caught the article on electricity, and he could not rest until he had read it. He procured a glass vial, an old pan, and a few simple articles, and began to experiment. A customer became interested in the boy, and took him to hear Sir Humphrey Davy lecture on chemistry. He summoned courage to write the great scientist, and sent the notes he had taken of his lecture. One night, not long after, just as Michael was about to retire, Sir Humphrey Davy's carriage stopped at his humble lodging, and a servant handed him a written invitation to call upon the great lecturer the next morning. Michael could scarcely trust his eyes as he read the note. In the morning he called as requested, and was engaged to clean instruments and take them to and from the lecture room. He watched eagerly every movement of Davy, as with a glass mask over his face, he developed his safety lamp and experimented with dangerous explosives. Michael studied and experimented too, and it was not long before this poor boy with no chance was invited to lecture before the great philosophical society. He was appointed professor at the Royal Academy of Woolwich and became the wonder of the age in science. Tyndall said of him, he is the greatest experimental philosopher the world has ever seen. When Sir Humphrey Davy was asked what was his greatest discovery, he replied, Michael Faraday. <laughs> what has been done can be done again, said the boy with no chance. Disraeli, who became Lord Beaconsfield, England's great Prime Minister. I am not a slave. I am not a captive, and by energy 
I can overcome greater obstacles. Jewish blood flowed in his veins, and everything seemed against him. But he remembered the example of Joseph, who became prime minister of Egypt four thousand years ago, and that of Daniel, who was prime minister to the greatest despot of the world five centuries before the birth of Christ. He pushed his way up through the lower classes, up through the middle classes, up through the upper classes, until he stood a master, self-poised upon the topmost round of political and social power, rebuffed, scorned, ridiculed, hissed down in the House of Commons. He simply said, The time will come when you will hear me. The time did come, and the boy with no chance but a determined will swayed the sceptre of England for a quarter of a century. Henry Clay, the mill boy of the Slashers, was one of seven children of a widow too poor to send him to any but a common country school, where he was drilled only in the three R's. But he used every spare moment to study without a teacher, and in after years he was a king among self-made men. The boy who had learned to speak in a barn, with only a cow and a horse for an audience, became one of the greatest of American orators and statesmen. See Kepler's struggling with poverty and hardship, his books burned in public by order of the state, his library locked up by the Jesuits, and himself exiled by public clamor. For seventeen years he works calmly upon the demonstration of the great principles that planets revolve in ellipses, with the sun at one focus, that a line connecting the center of the earth with the center of the sun passes over equal spaces in equal times, and that the squares of the times of revolution of the planets above the sun are proportioned to the cubes by their mean distances from the sun. This boy with no chance became one of the world's greatest astronomers. When I found that I was black, said Alexandre Dumas, I resolved to live as if I were white, and so force men to look below my skin. How slender seemed the chance of James Sharples, the celebrated blacksmith artist of England. He was very poor, but he often rose at three o'clock, to copy books he could not buy. He would walk eighteen miles to Manchester and back after a hard day's work to buy a shilling's worth of artist's materials. He would ask for the heaviest work in the blacksmith's shop because it took a longer time to heat at the forge and he could thus have many spare minutes to study the precious book which he propped up against the chimney. He was a great miser of spare moments and used every one as though he might never see another. He devoted his leisure hours for five years to that wonderful production, The Forge, copies of which are to be seen in many a home. What chance had Galileo to win renown in physics or astronomy when his parents compelled him to go to a medical school? Yet while Venus slept, he stood in the tower of St. Mark's Cathedral and discovered the satellites of Jupiter and the phases of Venus, through a telescope made with his own hands. When compelled on bended knee to publicly renounce his heretical doctrine that the earth moves around the sun, all the terrors of the Inquisition could not keep this feeble man of threescore years and ten from muttering to himself, Yet it does move. When thrown into prison, so great was his eagerness for scientific research, that he proved by a straws in his cell that a hollow tube is relatively much stronger than a solid rod of the same size. Even when totally blind, he kept constantly at work. Imagine the surprise of the Royal Society of England when the poor unknown Herschel sent in the report of his discovery of the star Georgium Sidus its orbit and rate of motion, and of the rings and satellites of Saturn. The boy with no chance, who had played the oboe for his meals, 
had with his own hands made the telescope through which he discovered facts unknown to the best equipped astronomers of his day. He had ground two hundred speculae before he could get one perfect. George Stevenson was one of eight children whose parents were so poor that all lived in a single room. George had to watch cows for a neighbor, but he managed to get time to make engines of clay with hemlock sticks for pipes. At seventeen, he had charge of an engine, with his father for fireman. He could neither read nor write, but the engine was his teacher, and he a faithful student. While the other hands were playing games or loafing in liquor shops during the holidays, George was taking his machine to pieces, cleaning it, studying it, and making experiments in engines. When he had become famous as a great inventor of improvements in engines, those who had loafed and played called him lucky. Without a charm of face or figure, Charlotte Cushman resolved to place herself in the front rank as an actress, even in such characters as Rosalind and Queen Catherine. The star actress was unable to perform, and Miss Cushman her understudy, took her place. That night she held her audience with such grasp of intellect and iron will that it forgot the absence of mere dimpled feminine grace. Although poor, friendless, and unknown before, when the curtain fell upon her first performance at the London theatre, her reputation was made. In after years, when physicians told her she had a terrible, incurable disease, she flinched not a particle, but quietly said, I have learned to live with my trouble. A poor colored woman in a log cabin in the south had three boys, but could afford only one pair of trousers for the three. She was so anxious to give them an education that she sent them to school by turns. The teacher, a northern girl, noticed that each boy came to school only one day out of three, and that all wore the same pantaloons. The poor mother educated her boys as best she could. One became a professor in a southern college, another a physician, and the third a clergyman. What a lesson for boys who plead, no chance, as an excuse for wasted lives. Sam Cunard the whittling Scotch lad of Glasgow, wrought many odd inventions with brain and jackknife, but they brought neither honour nor profit until he was consulted by Burns and MacIver, who wished to increase their facilities for carrying foreign mails. The model of a steamship which Sam whittled out for them was carefully copied for the first vessel of the great Cunard Line and became the standard type for all the magnificent ships since constructed by the firm. The New Testament and the Speller were Cornelius Vanderbilt's only books at school, but he learned to read, write, and cipher a little. He wished to buy a boat, but had no money. To discourage him from following the sea, his mother told him if he would plough, harrow, and plant with corn, before the twenty-seventh day of the month, ten acres of rough, hard, stony land, the worst on his father's farm, she would lend him the amount he wished. Before the appointed time, the work was done, and well done. On his seventeenth birthday, he bought the boat, but on his way home it struck a sunken wreck and sank just as he reached shallow water. But Cornelius Vanderbilt was not the boy to give up. He at once began again, and in three years saved $3,000. He often worked all night, and soon had far the largest patronage of any boatman in the harbor. During the War of 1812, he was awarded the government contract to carry provisions to the military stations near the metropolis. He fulfilled his contract by night so that he might run his ferry boat between New York and Brooklyn by day. The boy who gave his parents all his day earnings and had half of what he got at night 
was worth thirty thousand dollars at thirty-five, and when he died at an advanced age, he left to his thirteen children one of the largest fortunes in America. Lord Eldon might well have pleaded no chance when a boy, for he was too poor to go to school or even to buy books. But no, he had grit and determination, and was bound to make his way in the world. He rose at four o'clock in the morning and copied law books which he borrowed, the voluminous Coke upon Littleton, among others. He was so eager to study that sometimes he would keep it up until his brain refused to work, when he would tie a wet towel about his head to enable him to keep awake and to study. His first year's practice brought him but nine shillings, yet he was bound not to give up. When Eldon was leaving the chamber, the solicitor tapped him on the shoulder and said, Young man, your bread and butter's cut for life. The boy with no chance became Lord Chancellor of England and one of the greatest lawyers of his age. Stephen Gerard had no chance. He left his home in France when ten years old and came to America as a cabin boy. His great ambition was to get on and succeed at any cost. There was no work, however hard and disagreeable, that he would not undertake. Midas-like, he turned to gold everything he touched, and became one of the wealthiest merchants of Philadelphia. His abnormal love of money cannot be commended, but his thoroughness in all he did, his public spirit at times of national need, and willingness to risk his life to save strangers sick with the deadly yellow fever, are traits of character well worthy of imitation. John Wanamaker walked four miles to Philadelphia every day, and worked in a bookstore for one dollar and twenty-five cents a week. He next worked in a clothing store at an advance of twenty-five cents a week. From this he went up and up, until he became one of the greatest living merchants. He was appointed Postmaster General by President Harrison in 1889, and in that capacity showed great executive ability. Prejudice against her race and sex did not deter the colored girl, Edmonia Lewis, from struggling upward to honor and fame as a sculptor. Fred Douglas started in life with less than nothing, for he did not own his own body, and he was pledged before his birth to pay his master's debts. To reach the starting point of the poorest white boy, he had to climb as far as the distance which the latter must ascend if he would become President of the United States. He saw his mother but two or three times, and then, in the night, when she would walk twelve miles to be with him an hour, returning in time to go into the field at dawn. He had no chance to study, for he had no teacher, and the rules of the plantation forbade slaves to learn to read and write. But somehow, unnoticed by his master, he managed to learn the alphabet from scraps of paper and patent medicine almanacs, and then no limits could be placed to his career. He put to shame thousands of white boys, who fled from slavery at twenty-one, went north and worked as a stevedore in New York and New Bedford. At Nantucket he was given an opportunity to speak at an anti-slavery meeting, and made so favorable an impression that he was made agent of the Anti-Slavery Society of Massachusetts. While traveling from place to place to lecture, he would study with all his might. He was sent to Europe to lecture, and won the friendship of several Englishmen, who gave him $750, with which he purchased his freedom. He edited a paper in Rochester, New York, and afterwards conducted the New Era in Washington. For several years he was marshal of the District of Columbia. Henry E. Dixie, the well-known actor, 
began his career upon the stage in the humble part of the hind legs of a cow. P. T. Barnum rode a horse for ten cents a day. It was a boy born in a log cabin without schooling or books or teacher or ordinary opportunities who won the admiration of mankind by his homely practical wisdom while president during our civil war and who emancipated four million slaves behold this long lank awkward youth felling trees on the little claim building his homely log cabin without floor or windows teaching himself arithmetic and grammar in the evening by the light of the fireplace in his eagerness to know the contents of Blackstone's commentaries, he walked forty-four miles to procure the precious volumes, and read one hundred pages while returning. Abraham Lincoln inherited no opportunities, and acquired nothing by luck. His good fortune consisted simply of untiring perseverance and a right heart. In another log cabin, in the backwoods of Ohio, a poor widow is holding a boy eighteen months old, and wondering if she will be able to keep the wolf from her little ones. The boy grows, and in a few years we find him chopping wood and tilling the little clearing in the forest to help his mother. Every spare hour is spent in studying the books he has borrowed but cannot buy. At sixteen he gladly accepts a chance to drive mules on a canal towpath. Soon he applies for a chance to sweep floors and ring the bell of an academy, to pay his way while studying there. His first term at Gugar Seminary cost him but seventeen dollars. When he returned the next term, he had but a sixpence in his pocket, and this he put into the contribution box at church the next day. He engaged board, washing, fuel, and light of a carpenter at one dollar and six cents a week, with the privilege of working at night and on Saturdays all the time he could spare. He had arrived on a Saturday and planed fifty-one boards that day, from which he received one dollar and two cents. When the term closed, he had paid all expenses and had three dollars over. The following winter he taught school at twelve dollars a month, and board around. In the spring he had forty-eight dollars, and when he returned to school he boarded himself at an expense of thirty-one cents a week. Soon we find him in Williams College, where in two years he is graduated with honors. He reaches the state senate at twenty-six, and congress at thirty-three. Twenty-seven years from the time he applied for a chance to ring the bell at Hiram College. James A. Garfield became President of the United States. The inspiration of such an example is worth more to the young men of America than all the wealth of the Astors, the Vanderbilts, and the Golds. Among the world's greatest heroes and benefactors are many others whose cradles were rocked by want in lowly cottages, and who buffeted the billows of fate without dependence save upon the mercy of God and their own energies. The little grey cabin appears to be the birthplace of all your great men, said an English author who had been looking over a book of biographies of eminent Americans. With five chances on each hand and one unwavering aim, no boy, however poor, need despair. There is bread and success for every youth under the American flag who has energy and ability to seize his opportunity. It matters not whether the boy is born in a log cabin or in a mansion. If he is dominated by a resolute purpose and upholds himself, neither men nor demons can keep him down. End of chapter 3 Boys with no chance. Chapter 4 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat 
Marden, the country boy. The Napoleonic Wars so drained the flower of French manhood that even today the physical stature of the average Frenchman is nearly half an inch below what it was at the beginning of Napoleon's reign. The country in America today is constantly paying a similar tribute to the city in the sacrifice of its best blood, its best brain, the finest physical and mental fiber in the world. This great stream of superb country manhood, which is ever flowing cityward, is rapidly deteriorated by the softening, emasculating influences of the city, until the superior virility, stamina, and sturdy qualities entirely disappear in two or three generations of city life. Our city civilization is always in a process of decay, and would, in a few generations, become emasculated and effeminate were it not for the pure, crystal stream of country youth flowing steadily into and purifying the muddy, devitalized stream of city life. It would soon become so foul and degenerate as to threaten the physical and moral health of city dwellers. One of our great men says that one of the most unfortunate phases of modern civilization is the drift away from the farm, the drift of country youth to the city, which has an indescribable fascination for him. His vivid imagination clothes it with Arabian nights, possibilities and joys. The country seems tame and commonplace after his first dream of the city. To him it is synonymous with opportunity, with power, with pleasure. He cannot rid himself of its fascination until he tastes its emptiness. He cannot know the worth of the country and how to appreciate the glory of its disadvantages and opportunities until he has seen the sham and shallowness of the city. One of the greatest boons that can ever come to a human being is to be born on a farm and reared in the country. Self-reliance and grit are oftenest country bred. The country boy is constantly thrown upon his own resources, forced to think for himself, and this calls out his ingenuity and inventiveness. He develops better all-round judgment and a more level head than the city boy. His muscles are harder, his flesh firmer, and his brain fiber partakes of the same superior quality. The very granite hills, the mountains, the valleys, the brooks, the miracle of the growing crops, are every moment registering their mighty potencies in his constitution, putting iron into his blood and stamina into his character, all of which will help to make him a giant when he comes to compete with the city-bred youth. The sturdy, vigorous, hardy qualities, the stamina, the brawn, the grit, which characterize men who do great things in this world, are, as a rule, country-bred. If power is not absorbed from the soil, it certainly comes from very near it. There seems to be a close connection between robust character and the soil, the hills, mountains and valleys, the pure air and sunshine. There is a very appreciable difference between the physical stamina, the brain vigor, the solidity and the reliability of country-bred men and that of those in the city. The average country-bred youth has a better foundation for success building, has greater courage, more moral stamina. He has not become weakened and softened by the superficial ornamental decorative influences of city life. And there is a reason for all this. We are largely copies of our environment. We are under the perpetual influence of the suggestion of our surroundings. The city-bred youth sees and hears almost nothing that is natural, aside from the faces and forms of human beings. Nearly everything that confronts him from morning till night is artificial, man-made. He sees hardly anything that God made that imparts solidity, strength, and power, as do the natural objects in the country. How can a man build up a solid, substantial character when his eyes and ears bring him only sights and sounds of artificial things? 
a vast sea of business blocks skyscrapers and asphalt pavements does not generate character building material just as sculpture was once carried to such an extreme that pillars and beams were often so weakened by the extravagant carvings as to threaten the safety of the structure so the timber in country boys and girls when brought to the city is often overcarved and adorned at the cost of strength robustness and vigor in other words virility forcefulness physical and mental stamina reach their maximum in those who live close to the soil the moment a man becomes artificial in his living takes on artificial conditions he begins to deteriorate to soften much of what we call the best society in our cities is often in an advanced process of decay the muscles may be a little more delicate but they are softer the skin may be a little fairer but it is not so healthy the thought a little more supple but less vigorous the whole tendency of life in big cities is toward deterioration city people rarely live really normal lives it is not natural for human beings to live far from the soil it is mother earth and country life that give vitality stamina courage and all the qualities which make for manhood and womanhood what we get from the country is solid substantial enduring reliable what comes from the artificial conditions of the city is weakening enervating and softening the country youth on the other hand is in the midst of a perpetual miracle he cannot open his eyes without seeing a more magnificent painting than a raphael or a michelangelo could have created in a lifetime and this magnificent panorama is changing every instant there is a miracle going on in every growing blade of grass and flower is it not wonderful to watch the chemical processes in nature's laboratory mixing and flinging out to the world the gorgeous colorings and marvelous perfumes of the rose and wild flower no city youth was ever in such a marvelous kindergarten where perpetual creation is going on in such a vast multitude of forms the city youth has too many things to divert his attention such a multiplicity of objects appeals to him that he is often superficial he lacks depth his mind is perpetually drawn away from his subject and he lacks continuity of thought and application his reading is comparatively superficial he glances through many papers magazines and periodicals and gives no real thought to any his evenings are much more broken up than those of the country boy who having very little diversion after supper can read continuously for an entire evening on one subject the country boy does not read as many books as the city boy but as a rule he reads them with much better results the dearth of great libraries books and periodicals is one reason why the country boy makes the most of good books and articles often reading them over and over again while the city youth in the midst of newspapers and libraries sees so many books that in most instances he cares very little for them and will often read the best literature without absorbing any of it the fact is that there is such a diversity of attractions and distractions of temptation and amusement in the city that unless a youth is made of unusual stuff he will yield to the persuasion of the moment and follow the line of least resistance it is hard for the city-bred youth to resist the multiplicity of allurements and pleasures that bid for his attention to deny himself and turn a deaf ear to the appeals of his associates and tie himself down to self-improvement while those around him are having a good time these exciting diverting tempting conditions of city life are not conducive to generating the great master purpose the one unwavering life aim which we often see so marked in the young man from the country nor do city-bred youths store up anything like the reserve power the cumulative force the stamina 
which are developed in the simple life of the soil. For one thing, the country boy is constantly developing his muscular system. His health is better. He gets more exercise, more time to think and to reflect. Hence, he is not so superficial as the city boy. His perceptions are not so quick. He is not so rapid in his movements. His thought action is slower, and he does not have as much polish, it is true. But he is better balanced generally. He has been forced to do a great variety of work, and this has developed corresponding mental qualities. The drudgery of the farm, the chores which we hated as boys, the rocks which we despised, we have found were the very things which educated us, which developed our power and made us practical. The farm is a great gymnasium, a superb manual training school, nature's kindergarten, constantly calling upon the youth's self-reliance and inventiveness. He must make the implements and toys which he cannot afford to buy or procure. He must run, adjust, and repair all sorts of machinery and farm utensils. His ingenuity and inventiveness are constantly exercised. If the wagon or plow breaks down, it must be repaired on the spot, often without the proper tools. This training develops instinctive courage, strong success quality, and makes him a resourceful man. Is it any wonder that the boy so trained in self-reliance, so superbly equipped with physical and mental stamina, should take such preeminence, should be in such demand, when he comes to the city? Is it any wonder that he is always in evidence in great emergencies and crises? Just stand a stamina-filled, self-reliant country boy beside a pale, soft, stamina-less, washed-out city youth. Is it any wonder that the country-bred boy is nearly always the leader, that he heads the banks, the great mercantile houses? It is this peculiar, indescribable something, this superior stamina and mental caliber, that makes the stuff that rises to the top in all vocations. There is a peculiar quality of superiority which comes from dealing with realities that we do not find in the superficial city conditions. The life-giving oxygen, breathed in great inspirations through constant muscular effort, develops in the country boy much greater lung power than is developed in the city youth, and his outdoor work tends to build up a robust constitution. Plowing, hoeing, mowing, everything he does on the farm gives him vigor and strength. His muscles are harder, his flesh firmer, and his brain fiber partakes of the same superior quality. He is constantly bottling up forces, storing up energy in his brain and muscles, which later may be powerful factors in shaping the nation's destiny, or which may furnish backbone to keep the ship of state from floundering on the rocks. This marvelous reserve power which he stores up in the country will come out in the successful banker, statesman, lawyer, merchant, or businessman. Self-reliance and grit are oftenest country-bred. The country boy is constantly thrown upon his own resources. He is forced to think for himself, and this calls out his ingenuity and makes him self-reliant and strong. It has been found that the use of tools in our manual training schools develops the brain, strengthens the deficient faculties, and brings out latent powers. The farm-reared boy is in the best manual training school in the world, and is constantly forced to plan things, make things. He is always using tools. This is one of the reasons why he usually develops better all-round judgment and a more level head than the city boy. It is human nature to exaggerate the value of things beyond our reach. People save money for years in order to go to Europe, to visit the great art centers and see the famous masterpieces, when they have really never seen the marvelous pictures painted by the divine artist and spread in the landscape, in the sunset, in the glory of flowers and plant life, 
right at their very doors. What a perpetual inspiration! What marvels of beauty! What miracles of coloring are spread everywhere in nature, confronting us on every hand! We see them almost every day of our lives, and they become so common that they make no impression upon us. Think of the difference between what a Ruskin sees in a landscape and the impression conveyed to his brain, and what is seen by the ordinary mind, the ordinary person, who has little or no imagination, and whose aesthetic faculties have scarcely been developed. We are immersed in a wilderness of mysteries and marvellous beauties, miracles innumerable in grass and flower and fruit are performed right before our eyes. How marvellous is nature's growing of fruit, for example! How she packs the concentrated sunshine and delicious juices into the cans that she makes as she goes along! Cans exactly the right size, without a particle of waste, leakage or evaporation, with no noise of factories, no hammering of tins. The miracles are wrought in a silent laboratory, not a sound is heard, and yet what marvels of skill, deliciousness, and beauty! What interrogation points, what wonderful mysteries, what wit sharpness are ever before the farmer boy, whichever way he turns! Where does all this tremendous increase of corn, wheat, fruit, and vegetables come from? There seems to be no loss to the soil, and yet what a marvellous growth in everything! Life, life, more life on every hand. Wherever he goes he treads on chemical forces which produce greater marvels than are described in the Arabian nights. The trees, the brooks, the mountains, the hills, the valleys, the sunsets, the growing animals on the farm, are all mysteries that set him thinking and to wondering at the creative processes which are working on every hand. Then again, the delicious freedom of it all, as contrasted with the cramped, artificial life in the city. Everything in the country tends to set the boy thinking, to call out his dormant powers, and develop his latent forces. And what health there is in it all! How hearty and natural he is in comparison with the city boy, who is tempted to turn night into day, to live an artificial, purposeless life. The very temptation in the city to turn night into day is of itself health undermining, stamina dissipating, and character weakening. While the city youth is wasting his precious energy capital in late hours, pleasure seeking and often dissipation, the country youth is storing up power and vitality. He is being recharged with physical force by natural, refreshing sleep away from the distracting influence and enervating excitement of city life. The country youth does not learn to judge people by the false standards of wealth and social standing. He is not inculcated with snobbish ideas. Everything in the great farm kindergarten teaches him sincerity, simplicity, and honesty. The time was when the boy who gave no signs of genius or unusual ability was consigned to the farm, and the brilliant boy was sent to college or to the city to make a career for himself. But we are now beginning to see that man has made a botch of farming, only because he looked upon it as a sort of humdrum occupation, as a means provided by nature for living getting, for those who were not good for much else. Farming was considered by many people as a sort of degrading occupation, desirable only for those who lacked the brains and education to go into a profession or some of the more refined callings. But the searchlight of science has revealed in it possibilities hitherto undreamed of. We are commencing to realize that it takes a high order of ability and education to bring out the fullest possibilities of the soil, that it requires fine-grained sympathetic talent. We are now finding that agriculture is as great a science as astronomy, and that ignorant men have been getting an indifferent living from their farms, 
simply because they did not know how to mix brains with the soil. The science of agriculture is fast becoming appreciated, and is more and more regarded as a high and noble calling, a dignified profession. Think of what it means to go into partnership with the Creator, in bringing out larger, grander products from the soil, to be able to cooperate with that divine creative force, and even to vary the size, the beauty, the perfume of flowers, to enlarge, modify, and change the flavor of fruits and vegetables to our liking. Think what it must mean to be a magician in the whole vegetable kingdom, like Luther Burbank, changing colors, flavors, perfumes, species. Almost anything is possible when one knows enough and has heart and sympathy enough to enter into partnership with the great creative force in nature. Mr. Burbank says that the time will come when man will be able to do almost anything he wishes in the vegetable kingdom, will be able to produce at will any shade or color he wishes, and almost any flavor in any fruit, that the size of all fruits and vegetables and flowers is just a matter of sufficient understanding, and that nature will give us almost anything when we know enough to treat her intelligently, wisely, and sympathetically. The history of most great men shows that there is a disadvantage in having too many advantages. Who can tell what the consequences would have been had Lincoln been born in New York and educated at Harvard? If he had been reared in the midst of great libraries, brought up in an atmosphere of books, of only a small fraction of which he could get even a superficial knowledge, would he have had that insatiable hunger which prompted him to walk twenty miles in order to borrow Blackstone's commentaries and to read one hundred pages on the way home? What was there in that rude frontier forest where this poor boy scarcely ever saw anyone who knew anything of books to rouse his ambition and to stimulate him to self-education? Whence came that yearning to know the history of men and women who had made a nation, to know the history of his country? Whence came that passion to devour the dry statutes of Indiana, as a young girl would devour a love story? Whence came that all-absorbing ambition to be somebody in the world, to serve his country with no selfish ambition? Had his father been rich and well-educated instead of a poor man, who could neither read nor write, and who was generally of a shiftless and roving disposition, there is no likelihood that Lincoln would ever have become the powerful man he was. Had he not felt that imperious must calling him, the prod of necessity spurring him on, whence would have come the motive which led him to struggle for self-development, self-unfoldment, if he had been born and educated in luxury, his character would probably have been soft and flabby in comparison with what it was. Where in all the annals of history is there another record of one born of such poor parentage and reared in such a wretched environment, who ever rose to such eminence? Imagine a boy of today, so hungry for an education, that he would walk nine miles a day to attend a rude frontier school in a log cabin. What would the city boys of today, who do not want to walk even a few blocks to school, think of a youth who would do what Lincoln did to overcome his handicap? End of chapter 4